All right, so um, I'm going to keep talking about the database and login and uh, Node.js in general. I'm not going to start React yet, but that's coming next week. We'll probably get into uh, React. And I did post the lecture last time here. I'm recording again today, so I'll get that posted. And I don't know why the projectors are not on. They're off. They're still on. I didn't get my glasses on. Right. Oh. Are there any questions before I just jump in here? And just Here goes. I'm going into the map application. I'm going to check. I think I pushed everything to the repo. And uh, I'll just check that. Your branch is up to date with Origin Master. So Origin Master is the remote repo. So we're up to date with that remote repo. Okay. And here's the code. And uh, here we're importing, or we're importing some uh, modules, activating modules, getting links, references to the loaded modules. And we took this logger out. We could put it in if we wanted. And it was some uh, two routers. These were generated by Express uh, Generator, index router and usage router. So this I was using for uh, private protected resources. So things that require um, the user to be logged in. So that's called the user's router. Anything that doesn't require a login, I'm putting in the, inside the index router. Let me uh, I can adjust the light. We don't have to do it that way. We just, we just, we have to kind of come up with, you know, like kind of guidelines or rules that we're following. Because when the code gets large, and you need to work on a large body of code, I mean, it's huge, thousands of lines of code. It's very hard to make changes to it if it's not, if it doesn't follow predictable patterns. So when you go to build something or to find something, you have to think about, well, how am I going to figure this out later on when I need to get to this code? So you have to start thinking in terms of patterns or rules that, uh, that you follow when you're coding. So the index routers to handle requests that don't require a login. The user router is to requests that do require a login. And uh, here, so we configured the, uh, the uh, engine, the pug, that's the, what do they call it, template engine. And here we configure the two routers. Here's some middleware that we're configuring. So when we do this, see this app.use? One, two, three, four, five, see that? Every request that comes in, to the web server first passes through this middleware. And that middleware will maybe modify the, the request objects. Normally, the middleware modifies the request object. Normally, that's what it does. That's where it puts its information. So this is a JSON parser. So if there's data coming in uh, through the body of the HTTP message, the JSON parser is going to parse it for us and, um, and give us access to it as a regular Java object. We don't have to manually, you know, uh, what do you call it, 
scan through the JSON and, and handle it ourselves. And then after the request passes through this JSON middleware, then it goes to the next piece of middleware. Oh, and this, if the, if the data in the body of the message is URL encoded, that's different in JSON. If the body of the message is JSON encoded, then this middleware is activated. But if we're submitting a form and the form is submitting normal URL encoded data, then this, this middleware is going to do nothing. It'll run. It'll look at the messages coming in from the browser and it'll say, well, I got nothing to do. That's, that's form data in URL encoding. That's not my responsibility. I just, I just look for JSON encoding. And if I find it, I'm going to decode it and put it in the request object. So this guy, this middleware does the same thing. It says, if there's URL encoded data in the body of the message, I will parse it and make it available as JavaScript objects in the request object. And then here's another piece of middleware. So that after the request goes through these two, the the, then, the request, then the the incoming message request passes through this cookie parser. And this will um, basically uh, read the cookie data from the HTTP headers and make that available through the request object as well. So everything is, these, these middleware uh, systems are modifying the request object. And we need this for login, by the way, because login is normally implemented using cookies. And so we've got a, a, a secret. Once, once a person gives us the username and password, uh, we set we, we, we set a, a cookie, which is a, a random string that's private. Nobody else knows. It's a shared secret between the server and the browser. So that's it's called a session cookie, by the way. And that's for implementing the session. So each time you pass the shared secret back and forth, we know that the other side is, you know, the client, well, it's the client that sends this, the shared secret to the server for each request. So every time we get that, that secret, we say, oh, okay, that's the logged in user. Remember, we log in with A, username A, password A. Remember that test code we got? And so we say, oh, oh, the secret comes in. Oh, that's A's secret. Okay, so that's good. That's that's A. So so, so this secret gets passed in as a cookie in each a subsequent request after the login. And then uh, here we have uh, this is this middleware here. This fourth piece of middleware is the uh, is processes requests for static files, you know, files that are in the file system. This is just things like style sheet files, JavaScript files. Those, those are static files. In other words, we don't change the contents of the CSS, you know, based on the user. So it's just a single file. It's not generated dynamically. So that's what this, uh, this express.static middleware does. And then finally, we have um, the session middleware. And what this does is it, um, it, stores, it, it stores session data. It keeps track of session data using cookies. And this is, uh, you know, this is part of the Express uh, framework. See, it's right up here. You can see session, require express dash session. So it's part of the, the express collection of uh, tools. And, but they make a point, uh, express developers make a point that this is only for testing. They don't recommend that, uh, that you can practice and use their session management uh, middleware. And that's, that's, that's up to you to decide. If you've got a low volume site, low volume application, I don't think it's a problem to tell you the truth. But if it's a big, Lots of volume. If you're going to handle increasing amounts of traffic, then uh, you, you certainly want to look at other um, session middleware. So these, see, we configure these middleware first. All messages pass through these middleware uh, systems one after another in a chain, and then finally 
we get to this, these, these routers are also middleware. So it's the same app.use. We use the same function to register middleware. So use, the use function is used to register middleware. Middleware, remember middleware is just something that is added to your system that's used to, uh, to process the messages that are coming in. And this is middleware that we write index router and users router. This is in, this is middleware that we didn't write that we're just bringing in from uh, NPM uh, repository. And here's a, and finally, look at this. So if, if the message passes through, say, here, uh, if the middleware doesn't want to handle it, it'll say, uh, if it handles, if this middleware handles it, if the index router handles the incoming message, that's the end of it. It doesn't, the message doesn't go to the next piece of middleware. It doesn't go to the next registered middleware uh, system. It's caught and handled here. But if the index router sees the message and says, well, all right, I don't know what to do with this. I'm not going to respond to that. Then it, it lets the message get hand, get passed on to the next middleware function. So it'll go to this middleware, the user's router. On the user's router, of course, for that to happen, the URL has to match this. Right? So if, it's, if the URL doesn't match that, then we, we, we don't send the message to the user's router. It has to match this. See, see, it's a little different. See these use calls up here? They only have one argument. They just have the, the reference to the middleware function. Express.json, that returns a function, a reference to a function. It returns a function, a reference to a function. And so we're passing a single argument. So, we could, so that means that function is then used for every single message coming in. But here, when we call use with two arguments, the first argument is the path. So only messages that match this path will go to this router, this middleware. Only messages that match this path will go to this router. And if it doesn't match this path, it'll be skipped over. Now, if, if, if the message is not handled and terminated by, at this point, then it'll continue to go to the next middleware function. Here's the next middleware function. Well, look at this. A middleware function, you can see it right here, the signature of a middleware function. It's just a function that takes three arguments. There it is, one, two, three. Let me do that again. Middleware is simply a function that takes three arguments, a request object, a response object, and a next pointer, a pointer to the next middleware that needs, or the next handler that needs to run, request handler. I think that's the next middleware, the next middleware. And uh, so here, if, so at this point, if we don't handle the message at this point, it means it's, it's got to be an error because it's passed through all of our stuff. So at this point, we're going to, we create a 404 error and then uh, using this function, create error. And I'm not sure if that's ours or not. And we pass it into, uh, so this, this create error, this function here actually creates an instance of the error class, JavaScript error class, I think. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's an object. This create error, this call to the function create error returns an object. It's a, it's a type of um, like a, an exception object, or they call it error. It's an error object spelled E-R-R-O-R. -R -R. And uh, so in that error object, we pass into the next function. So next, if you pass something into next, I believe that means it's, uh, you're passing in a, probably it means you're passing in an exception. You're passing it an error. You're passing it an error object. So that's why the very next middleware that runs gets the error object in the first position here.
So we know that this is uh, non-empty because we hit, we went through here. And uh, there it is. Next, uh, let me see. Yeah, I'm not actually sure how this works. I think that's enough for now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that rest at that point. And then we have this DB class. We looked at this last time. And uh, we don't need this, I'm sure. Take that out. So the PG module, this is the PG is the driver for interacting with the Postgres database. And uh, this you know, this, this line here is equivalent to saying this. See that we could have done it like this. This would have been give us the same result. So pool is simply a an attribute of the um, of this uh, module, whatever is returned by require for this module, this loaded module. But this is the kind of a new syntax here. You know, it looks like that, so we don't need to. When we use the braces here, then uh, it'll lo it'll locate a an attribute of this name in that belongs to the object on the right hand side of the assignment. Okay, and uh, so this is a constructor, by the way. So what we're getting from that, from the PG module, is a constructor function, and then we we use it right away. And this constructor function, it, it's can it's used to set up the database connection pool. Remember, when we need to hit the database, we've got to we have to do this handshaking process of the database. It's a hello database. I say hello client. I says, this is, my use, this is my database username and password. The database says, well, thank you. you know, you're know, you authenticated. OK, now I want to do this. And it says, OK, here's your result. So that that whole overhead is uh, it's too much when you're in a web app because in a web application, you've got simultaneous clients. So you have many clients simultaneously sending messages in. So it's all like a multi-user environment, a multi-threaded environment. And uh, so rather than going through that lengthy handshaking process, you know, authentication and all that, connection establishment, you just up front, you create a pool of connections and just set them aside, ready to go. And then when, well, after you use the connection from the pool, you don't close the connection because you don't want to have to re-authenticate and establish a new TCP connection. And so we cut all that, that overhead out. So we use a pool. All right, so this pool object is going to need to know the database username. That's my username. And it'll be, depending on the system you're running on, you might need to change this. And then uh, the location of the, where the database can be found, well, it's on the local host. Well, that's not typical in a web application. Normally, your database is some other machine, right? Or maybe multiple machines. Because, you know, web. Web apps, if you're serving large numbers of people, uh, they have to scale up, and that means adding machines. So then you've got to have systems where you can attack machines on one after another. And uh, so just to give you a heads up on that, the name of the database. So normally these database servers have access to multiple databases. So you've got to give the name of the particular database that the server on that machine is handling. So this machine has the Postgres is running, but it has multiple databases. This is the one we want. This is our password. We didn't set it. This is the port number. This is, I believe that's the standard port number. If we omit this, it probably is all right. So this is just uh, to configure the, the connection pool. And uh, but this, at this point, not, nothing is hit. The, at this point, we, we, we don't hit the database. So what, for instance, I don't have the database running right now. And uh, so, but if you look, it, it, 
there's nothing in my code that hits a database when we start the application up. So I do npm start, I won't get any error message. It's running fine. But the database is not running. So what I like to do, so you won't, we won't get an error until we you know, try to log in. So log in A and A, right? That's, a, that's valid, that's good. This should fail because there's no database. The database is not running. Localhost didn't send any data. Oh, there it is. We threw an exception and shut down the, shut down the, the web application. Oh, by the way, when I, I used to develop code using Node.js, and I would never let an exception shut down the app like this. So I would catch that exception, and uh, I would keep the app running. But I'm not, we're not going to get into that now. Uh, so it's saying e Econ refused. Sounds like, I don't know what the E is, maybe electronic, but the connection is refused. The connection request, there's the port number, 5432. And you can see hints of this. See, TCP, Transport Control Protocol. You really need to know what TCP is. So look that up and read about it. It's very, very important. DNS, TCP, IP. You need to know what those terms mean. Those protocols, you need to know how they work. Anyway, you see, so the connection that that the web server makes to the to the database server uses TCP. It's called TCP. It's the same protocol that the browser uses to connect to the web server. See, all these remote systems, most of them are just using TCP to connect. But if and TCP gives guaranteed delivery of data, if you're not concerned about guaranteed delivery, you're just concerned about timing, like if you of voice, voice data. You know, voice data doesn't, to, in, uh, synchronous voice data doesn't tolerate uh, a delay beyond, say, 100 or 200 milliseconds. And if the data gets dropped, if the packet doesn't make it through the network, you're not going to resend that packet because, well, you know, the, the other end, it's a synchronous voice communication, so you just have to let the data go. So you don't use TCP in that scenario. That's the one scenario where you don't use the TCP protocol you use. UDP, it's a different kind of protocol, where you can, UDP is, is applications that are uh, data loss tolerant. All right, so I'm getting off on tangents. Let's fix this thing. And the way I want to fix it is, um, let's see, I'm going to go into... Forgot where that thing was. Wait a minute. Uh, all right, so let's just hit the data bit. Let's. Man, I don't want to get too fancy. So just to keep that in mind here, I'm not going to get into that now. Let's see. So what I like to do is I have usually I have code in there that hits the database with a simple select command just to check to see if the database is up and running. So I get I get told right away that the app cannot start up. This database is not available. Uh, well, I'm not going to put that in today, uh, or maybe later. All right, so we have this get password function, and let's look at how this function works. If I go into the routes folder, I look at this index. JS file. I see in here I've got the handler right here. This is the request handler that does the login. This is the request handler that serves the login form, the web page with the login form in it, because that's a GET request. See, see that GET? That's a GET method. So I want to register this handler to respond to GET requests that come in 
for this URL. But for post requests that come in, remember everything from the browser is called a request. It's an HTTP request. So when the when a HTTP post request comes in for the same URL, it's the same URL. Well, we're going to we're going to do something different when it's a post, because that means the user is submitting the form data. They're not asking for the form. This is where the user is asking for the form. This is where the user is asking is submitting the form data. So when when the user is submitting the form data, we we want that function. And I've highlighted it precisely. That's the function that's used to process the form submission. So that's called a handler, request handler. And uh, so remember, this the data is coming in in your URL encoded format. So the URL encoded middleware uh, gets that data and creates a body object in the request object. It tacks on a new object into the request object. You know that REQ object gets passed around all over the place. And then it tacks on that body object with a field, with the fields that match the, the form data. So there's a, there's a field in the form called user ID. Let's, let me check that. I'm going to go into the views for that. And then we're going to look at the login view. Um, you'll see here that uh, there's the name field right there. So this, this line here, this pub command here, says generate an input element of type text with attribute type equal to text and another attribute named name equal to user ID. So this is the name that, um, that user ID name. That's, that's the reason why this body object has a user ID field. And look, the body object also has a password field. That means we must have called, you know, there's a name in there, name equal password for another element. And there it is right there. This is another input element. And its its name is assigned to password, so that's why. Um, yeah, not that one. Sorry, take that all around. So that's that's where this comes from, right there. All right, so that's the uh, URL encoded middleware. And then, so so we pull out the user ID and a submitted password just for convenience to pull those two things out. Although we didn't have to, we could have just listed it right there. And then uh, we want to we want to check the the submitted password. We want to know if it's good or not. So we we, we ask the database, our database interaction module. So is, do you see the technique here? We don't hit the database. We don't have any database code here in the request handler. It gets too messy. You you know, typical. And this is the normal architecture. You've got request handlers. You don't jam in the details of hitting your database into your request handlers. You've got to create a layer of, of, of database. It's almost like your internal API for hitting your own database. If you need something from the database, you got to go to the DB module. You get it through. You see how that gives you some organizing principle there so it helps you organize where things go? Let's see. We need to get uh, you know the uh, the, fa the user's favorite color. Uh, so where how are we going to get that? Where are we going to put that code? Oh well, the favorite color coming out of the database that'll have to be in the DB module, and then we got to have a handler that gets you know. So you got to have these patterns, and that's that's it. So it, this database code is not in here. We just tuck it away in the DB module. So we have it says we define this get password function. And so we just call it. We call the get password function to handle it. And then uh, what is this? 
And now, now git password, the, the database module is going to have to hit the database, and that's going to be a slow process. So it has to be done in a callback. The, the reply has to be provided to us through a callback function. Just hitting the database is too slow. So that means when we call this get password function, when we implement it ourselves, you know, our code, our implementation of get password has to take a callback function. And here it is. We want the password for the user ID. That's the first argument, user ID. That's the pa password for that user. And then DB module, I give you the user ID. You look up the password for me. And once you get it, call this callback function for me. And this will this is this is the thing that consumes that password information that you're gonna look up for me. And I know you can't give it to me right now because it takes a long time to get. So, you know, I'm not gonna stand here and wait at the counter while you're cooking the food. Right? I'm gonna sit down at the table and the and the waiter is gonna bring the food to my table when it's ready. That, that's the style here. This is called asynchronous programming. All right, so this function. All these callback functions typically take an error object in the first position. That's the convention. And so normally you want this to be null. If it's not null, you can use an expression like this. Because if, if it's null or if it's undefined, I don't think it would be undefined. It would be null. So null is interpreted as false. So if it's null, then we don't know what's going on. Let's just throw the error. And uh, otherwise, let's check to see if you know there is no password. There's no user ID in the database. If that, in other words, the the, the this uh, the DB module will call our callback function with stored password set to null. That means I couldn't find it, and that's a convention. That's a the normal convention, null means I didn't find it in the database. So if that's the case, if stored password is null, then we're going to send the user back to the login page. We use the render method on the response object. And that's the method that we use to delegate uh, generation of the, of the response message to a template. And the name of the template is login. And this login template, remember when you when you render a template, the first argument is the name of the template. And the second argument is an object that contains the values, the placeholders that appear in the template. So there's going to be a placeholder for title, and there's going to be a placeholder for MSG. Here they are. There's the title. And there's the MSG. So those those that's that's data that's being passed in to through this render call. We call it to render. And then we got to remember we have to return, so we got to get out of there. And uh, or we could do we could do it like this. Let's do it like this. I think a lot of people find this uh, easier to read. Is that easier? Oh, let's do this. Look at this. Look at how much easier this is. Whoops. I don't want to I don't want to mix tabs and spaces. That's not good. Cuz you know a tab is an unknown number of spaces. So if you mix tabs and spaces, and your editing tool doesn't render the number of spaces that, that you want for your tabs, then you're going to get misalignment. So here, look at this. Is this easier to read? You know, if it's a bunch of if else's. So there's no there's no return statements in there. I think a lot of people would find this easier to read. So I'm, this is called refactoring. Remember. When I read when I read through my code, when I'm debugging, 
all if I see something that can be refactored, I do it right there on the spot. I just want to keep things very clean, consistent. All right. So if the submitted password is identical to the stored password, we're good. That means the user is going to be logged in. How do we log in a user? And this is an important, this is an important conceptual idea. Nail this one in. This you need to know this. This is how you do login, okay? What does it mean when you're logged in? It means that there's some piece of information put in the session object on the server side, the server memory. It's going to be keeping track of sessions. So maybe there's 300 users in the last you know, 10 minutes that have been hitting the site. That means you've got 300 sessions, 300 session objects in memory, in RAM probably. Or it could be the database too. Or other. I don't know. I say if you have so many sessions going on, maybe you don't want to use up all the RAM to store that stuff so you can have to store it in the database. But that's going to make the system run very slowly, so that's probably not a good idea in general. So the user gave us a good password. So what do we do? We got to make a note. We take the session data, the session object, we're going to say, okay, we're going to put the user ID in there. If the user ID is in the session object, it means the guy, remember the session, underlying the session is a cookie that the client is sending us, which contains a secret string that we gave them. We gave the browser a secret string. And it's sending it to us in every request. That's how we know that, oh, oh, you're done. And then and then on this side, on the on the node side, on the server side, we get the cookie and we look up the node uses that to look up the session object or express, rather, I'm sorry. Express uses that to look up the session objects, which is sitting in memory. And once we get that session object. The session object is then placed into a reference to the session object is placed into the request object, and that's done by the handler, that the middleware, that uh, what's it called, the uh, session middleware. The session middleware created this session object for us. So what we do is we modified a session object that the middleware created for us. We added a user ID field, and we set it equal to the user ID that, uh, that, that we know is, that we got the password for. And then we send the user to the, to the users page. So that's it. That's how we do login. If it's a bad password, then it's similar to it's similar to this line up here where we didn't get we didn't have a password. They got null for the password uh, field because the user ID is not in the database. So that that line is pretty is identical to this one. All right, any questions about this? I think I went through it pretty. Completely at this point. What else you want to do here? What else should we do? What do you want to do next? Should we stop here? Call it a day. Tinker with a little bit more. Give you more information, or what do you want to do? Another experiment. I'll just let you work. I can answer questions in a bit. I'm going to stop here. Good? Because this is a complete unit of information. I don't want to get into React or anything. I mean, there's lots of other things to talk about, like uh, writing into the database. And I don't think it would do you guys any good to see that at this point. You've got to struggle with it on your own for a while and come to me with questions or problems. Good? All right, killing this. I'm stopping the.